Greetings to you all. Welcome to the SeedCore 2021 Summer Crop Management Webinar. My name is Wendy Mazura, and with me today is Nyasha Churaise, and we are going to be taking you through some critical and important areas that you need to look at as you manage your crops for the 2020-21 farming season. So to kick us off, we are going to start off with some housekeeping issues. The presentation is being recorded and it will be shared after in the form of a link where you can then review if there are areas that you need to check and confirm on. A PowerPoint presentation will be beamed during the course of the presentation and questions are invited. Answers will be provided during the presentation as well as at the end of the presentation. The presentation layout is as follows. We are going to start off by looking at the good agronomic practices. Because at this point, our assumption is that you have established the right seed, the right genetics, and now you just need to unlock the potential in those varieties and crop uh, products that you will have established. So we'll start by looking at the fertilizer management. We'll then look at weed control, pest control and disease control, before we then look at safe use of agrochemicals, organic matter management and water harvesting, drainage management, as well as give you a few highlights in pictorial form of some of the activities that are happening in the field. Then we'll end up by looking at questions and giving you some answers to the questions that are burning and critical at the moment. So in farming and in any cropping venture, there are a thousand reasons for low yields, but there are only two reasons for profitable and lucrative farming. These are access to good genetics, which is the right seed, and adopting good agronomic practices. So having bought your right seeds and established the right seed from seed cause wide product basket, now we're going to discuss the issues that are going to unlock and help you to get the optimum yield possible from those varieties, having employed good agronomic practices, which are highlighted on the on the graph that you're seeing there, which include your soil type management, herbicide, water, disease control, and pest control. So moving on to look at fertilizer management in the broad sense. Fertilizer management is hinged on your ability to understand what the nutrient constitution of the crop in question is. And it also is guided by the universal principles of nutrient management, which are the right source, are you using the correct fertilizer for the correct crop at the correct time? You need also to take note of the fact that are you using the fertilizer the right way? The placement is important. Some fertilizers are going to be dissolved. These are soluble fertilizers. Some fertilizers are going to be side dressed. Some need to be incorporated in the soil. So you need to get that understanding of the fertilizer that you're going to be applying for it to work and for you to get maximum fertilizer use efficiency. So just to highlight on the basal fertilizers for maize, the range can be from around 300, 400 to about 500 kgs per hectare. But this should always be, and we continue to reiterate that soil analysis is the only way you can know which fertilizer is required by your soil, as well as to understand the nutrient constitution of your soil, as well as the carbon and organic matter content of your soil. This will help you to make an informed and custom made fertilizer choice and decision. Having looked at that, fertilizers have macro and micro elements. The macro elements are the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potash. These will differ in their constitution and quantities depending on the crop in question. We also find that the micro elements, though they are found in minute quantities, they are needed and they will add value to the crop in terms of boosting what the macro elements are doing and providing that extra niche value that is going to make that product of high quality. On top dressing, when we're looking at maize, the rates can be from 350 to 400 kgs per hectare, plus or minus, depending on the soil condition, as well as the crop in question, and the intended yield that you want to get from the particular crop. So when you're looking at AN, AN, when you're going to be applying it, especially in a season like the one we have, this year in the 2020-21 farming season, it's prudent 
for you to split, apply it into two or three splits. This season, some farmers even went above that in terms of split application because the incessant rainfall was causing high levels of leaching. And once the nitrogen is leached below, below the root zone, this will affect the uptake by the crop and the crop will register as if it was not given enough nitrogen, as we will see in the slides that are going to come. Also, when you're going to be using urea, it is recommended for you to understand the nature of the urea fertilizer. Yes, it brings about 46% of the nitrogen, but when you're going to be applying it, make sure that there is adequate moisture or moisture that is leaning towards being on the excess side because it needs to quickly dissolve for it to work effectively. Otherwise, if you're going to apply it on the surface, you need to come in with a light covering with some soil to avoid the incidence of volatilization, which is the loss of the, of the fertilizer into the atmosphere. So this will then reduce the efficacy and it will cause your crop not to perform as it was supposed to. Then moving on, looking at maize, the nutrient deficiencies that we were highlighting in the previous slide are here shown in pictorial form, where you find that the nitrogen deficiency is that general outlook of a yellowish looking crop. The misconception that is there is that if a crop is yellow, then it just follows that it's nitrogen deficiency. There are also some deficiencies that can give the same nature and outlook as that of the, of the nitrogen, but it will not be nitrogen. So you need to seek guidance and you also need to check with your agronomists, local agritech officers, be they from the ministry or from your all weather friends, CITCO, who are located across the country in the different provinces. Phosphorus deficiency will give you that purplish looking color, as well as potassium deficiency giving you that firing edgy uh, effect on the edges, as you can see there, which we refer to as potassium firing. And zinc, particularly in sandy soils, will give you that whitish looking color, especially on the inside of the leaves. So you need to take note of this and make sure that you make the necessary corrections and remedial uh, issues that you need to look at before the crop has been affected to a level when the economic yield will not be attained. Moving on to a more detailed explanation of the fertilizer requirements for maize, as we alluded to earlier on, fertilizer recommendations and rates should be guided by NPK ratios, which are the macro elements of any crop. For maize, we are looking at a range of around 160 to around 180 kgs and P2O of 80 and 40 kgs of K2O. So you need to also to make sure that the fertilizer that you're applying is meeting the requirements of the crop. This will be outside of you having done your soil analysis and done the corrective measures of pH as well as the other elements that are in significant short supply so that there is no uh, law of limiting uh, of, of limiting factors. So you need to make sure that you understand that your crop is only going to take as much nutrients as is going to be allowed by the factor that is most limiting. The other issue that you need to take note of is the fact that there are a wide range of fertilizers on the market. Basal fertilizers, yes, our assumption at this point, especially for maize, is that the basal fertilizer has been applied. Now we are talking about top dressing fertilizer. So you need to make sure that you are applying adequate amount of top dressing fertilizers at the right time, split applying, covering it depending on the type that you're going to use. Looking at foliar fertilizers, there are a wide range of foliar fertilizer options available on the market. Foliar fertilizer, the quick best range, the win range, the omni range. So you need to choose from the fertilizers that are available on the market, but you should be guided by the nutrient constitution because fertilizers are not known by their names. They are known by the number and percentages of nutrients that are available in the specified fertilizer. Moving on to soya bean. Soya bean nutrient deficiencies, you might find that as we said earlier on, deficiencies that are on the yellowish looking side are usually attributed to nitrogen deficiency but there are a wide range, as you can see, of yellowing that can occur in your crop. So you need to make sure that you are understanding the type of deficiency that you are getting and come in with the corrective measure that will give you the desired result. Looking at uh, sugar bean and uh, soya beans, 
the nutrient constitution is as highlighted, the nitrogen requirement is lower than that of maize, owing to the fact that legumes are going to fix nitrogen. However, we always speak to the fact that we need to increase productivity, which feeds into profitability, because farming is now a business. So you also need to come in with complementary applications of either you're going to apply your rhizobium bacteria, or you're going to apply your top dressing fertilizer, a light application. Looking at rhizobium, the assumption is at this point, it has been applied, especially on soya bean. But for, so, for sugar bean farmers who are still planting, you need to specify the type of rhizobium that you are getting and make sure that you are getting the rhizobium that is required and will work for sugar bean, as this will differ from that required for soya bean. There is the rhizobium for sugar bean. You need about 100, uh, uh, about 100 grams to treat 25 kg of seed, which is to say 400 kg of seed, you're going to need four sachets as opposed to soya bean. Then you are, not, you are going to come in with less water Instead of putting the one liter that you are going to use in soya bean, in sugar bean, you're going to use about 250 mils. Then you're going to come in with about three to four tablespoons of sugar to create a paste. This is to, for those farmers who are still planting their sugar bean crop at this time. Then looking at the other option, you need also to know that you can come in with inorganic fertilizers like your AN, 34.5% nitrogen to boost and make sure that you're getting the much needed value from the crop that you will have established. So you can apply between 100 to 200 kgs per hectare. We don't recommend that you go above that because you might end up promoting luxurious vegetative growth at the expense of the reproductive stage of the crop, which is meant to give us the economic yield. So you need to take note of that and be guided accordingly. Foliar fertilizers can also be used. But with foliar fertilizers, we need to understand that in nature, the crop is designed to feed principally through its roots. So foliar fertilizers might come in as a boost and add value to the crop, having been applied at minute quantities that are allowed without scorching the leaves. Just to give an overview of horticulture fertilizers that are important, horticulture products can be established throughout the year. And there's a wide range of cropping that is happening during in the horticulture sector intensive and extensively. So for the basal fertilizers in horticulture, you need to make sure that you understand that basal fertilizers differ in what they are going to bring to that horticultural crop and what it desires. Some horticultural crops are sensitive to, to chlorine quantities in the basal fertilizer. So they will require compound C or vegetable blends or specific fertilizers that are outlined as basal fertilizers for that particular crop. You can come in with top dressing fertilizers, your AN, some farmers can come in with niche products like potassium nitrate, calcium nitrate, magnesium sulfate, MOP, SOP. This will depend on the crop that will have been established, but they will add value to the horticultural crop, which in turn will increase on the quality of the produce and make your produce more desirable on the market and you will sell it on a larger scale. Then moving on, having looked at the fertilizer, now we are going to look at the classification of the weeds before we talk more about it, because this is where most of our farmers are falling off the bandwagon. The classification of weeds is hinged on your understanding of the different types of weeds that are prevalent in a given area. So you need to understand that the main broad classes of the weeds that we find, especially in Zimbabwe, are the grass weeds, the broad leaf weeds, the sedges. In the sedges family, we have the yellow, and the purple nut sedge. I've just put there the seedling stage of weeds just to explain and emphasize the point that you need to come in if you're going to be using herbicides at the seedling stage of weeds. That is when the herbicides are most effective. Otherwise, if the weeds have overgrown or some, if they flowered, that crop is not going to recover. Those weeds are, are just going to recover from that herbicide application and resume their consumption of the nutrients, their, their consumption of the moisture, as well as their colonization of the growing space that was supposed to be utilized by your crop. Did you know that one year of not weeding your crop, letting it to flower in the field, brings about seven additional years of you coming in with weeding? So we don't want weeds to be allowed to flower in the field. We need to control 
at the correct state. So effective weed control is guided by the fact that you need to understand the principles that speak to effective weed control, especially if you're looking at herbicides. But before we look at that, the methods of weed control that we want to just highlight, some farmers might want to come in with manual weeding, depending on their scale of production. Some farmers want to come with mechanical weeding. But speaking to issues to do with conservation and sustainable agriculture, we are advocating for minimum soil disturbance. So if you can come in with methods that are as conservative of the environment as possible, this will add value to your crop in the long run and build on your organic matter content. So looking at chemical control, herbicide use, one of the areas which is mostly misunderstood by farmers, owing to the fact that they do not take enough time to read and understand the label and seek advice and guidance before they use herbicides. Herbicides should be guided by the following factors. The weed spectrum to begin with. Are they broad leaves, grasses, are they sedges? They all should also be guided by the stage of control. Are you going to come in pre-emergence, post-emergence? Is it a mid-season application of, 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 the, of the herbicide? You need to speak to these areas so that you are guided accordingly. The rotation plan. Do you intend to come in with a crop of a similar nature to the one to which you were killing when you were applying the herbicide? Here, allow me to use the example of atrazine. Atrazine is a broadleaf herbicide used commonly in maize. However, if a farmer intends to come in with a broadleaf crop in the next six months to less than a year, then the high, up, the high rates of atrazine are not encouraged because they will have a residual effect in the soil of about 18 months. So if you don't understand this, what will happen is when you come in with your next crop, be it soybean, tobacco, or a broadleaf horticultural crop, the herbicide will register that it's a weed and it will destroy it. So you need to be guided accordingly. The cost, there are a wide range of herbicides on the market, but you need to make a conscious decision to do your homework and do your research. Otherwise, you might eat into your profit margins by spending unnecessarily high amounts on herbicides that are available at a good cost. But you need also to know that cheap is not always the best option. Original good genetics is encouraged. Original good chemistry is encouraged because it comes with benefits of new, advanced, and innovative technologies. We need to understand the weather. We need to understand whether or not there is wind or heavy rains. Looking at wind, the wind can result in drift, which can take that product from that particular field to the next, thereby causing challenges if you have established different crops in your in, in, in the same area. You can also find that issues to do with the rainfall, where you need to understand the rain fastness. And this is topical because nowadays the rains can come when they are not expected and they can come earlier uh, than anticipated. So it's important for you to also do your due diligence before applying a herbicide. Because if you're going to apply and it's washed off, the cost you're going to incur to come in and apply another herbicide is going to be high. And you're also going to probably be allowing the weed to grow to a stage when it will not be controlled effectively. So the rain fastness is encouraged. The range, the general range is from three to around six to eight hours of no rainfall from the time that you apply a particular herbicide. But some herbicides, without mentioning names, can do two hours. So it's important for you to seek advice and guidance from agrochemical specialists before you apply any product. So then we are just seeing the scenarios. This could be anybody's field. With the good genetics, do you see where we come from when we speak to issues to do with you unlocking genetic potential? Scenario A, there is nutrient deficiency because there is competition for, the, for nutrients by the weeds. Scenario B, the weeds have clogged the crop and we cannot even see which is the crop that was established. Scenario C is coming closer to home, but those weeds that are now starting to come, weeds are going to grow faster because they know that where they are growing, where they are not planted, so they're going to compete extensively with your crop. Scenario D is a, the, the ideal scenario that we would want, but the ideal scenario is the one that we are seeing on top there, where we cannot even identify a single weed. And you can even tell from the happiness that the crop is exuding 
from the shiny lush green color that we are seeing there. Then the maze here beside guides is that one that you're seeing on the screen. However, allow me to say that this is not an exhaustive list because new chemistry keeps on coming on board and there is new, there are new problematic weeds that are also coming in on board. So you need to speak to agrochemical specialists for you to get the best product for your problem weed and your desired cropping program. Then some weed management examples, looking at um, soya beans. As we can see there, those are weed-free fields and a weed-free seedbed gives the crop a good head start to establish itself well in advance and grow extensively, allowing it to give you the much needed plant population and the desired ultimate yield. Hand weeding can be done as you can see, but it depends on the scale of production. And you also want to take note of the fact that they are herbicides that differ in, we in sugar bean production and in soya bean production. So we should not use a blanket recommendation where we are saying, since this herbicide works in soya bean, therefore, it follows that I can use it in sugar bean. Least you burn your whole crop. So this should be taken seriously and at this time be guided accordingly. Pre-imagined herbicides such as metribuzin, which is um, the active ingredient of many products that might be available on the market, is not recommended for use in sugar bean, as well as classic. So you need to make sure that you are choosing products that are going to work in sugar bean and that are recommended for that particular crop. So the herbicide guide for soya bean is as highlighted there on your screen. Suffice to say, again, this list is not exhaustive. The horticulture weeds that you need to manage, horticulture crops, be they seedling, be they seeds, you need to come in on time and manage them so that you don't incur problems of competition as well as problems of harboring insect pests and diseases that might come from weeds that, in this, that are in the same family as the crop that you will have established. Take a look at that nightshade, nightshade crop. It looks like a tomato plant. So it's going to come in with challenges that are going to cause problems in your tomato crop. So you need to be guided accordingly. Aim to have a weed-free seed bed or field for the whole cropping cycle. So moving on, I'll hand you over to Nyasha for him to highlight the diseases that we are most likely to face in this different crop, as well as the pests, before we look at the other issues that we highlighted. Over to you, Nyasha. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nyasha Chiuraisa. I'm going to talk to you about uh, diseases and pest control. So uh, the basic uh, thing that I'm going to talk about is the disease triangle. So. Uh, disease, man uh, disease development is guided by three factors, which is uh, the first one is the favorable environment. Then we should have a susceptible host and a pathogen. Then in that case, a disease will, will develop. If one of the factors, if one of the factors is not uh, is controlled, uh, in that case, we manage uh, we manage the disease. So. Uh, if a susceptible host is controlled uh, due to genetics, if breeders come up with a resistant variety for a particular disease, in that case, uh, the disease will be controlled. So in the case of uh, using chemicals to control a disease, uh, we are killing the pathogen. So in that case, uh, our puzzle of uh, three factors that are causing the disease to develop is uh, controlled. Okay, uh, also, if you control the environment to make it unfavorable for the pathogen to, to grow and to multiply, in that case, you have, you have uh, reduced the effects, uh, the chances of the disease to develop and affect your yield. So in the case of a greenhouse, you, you might make, uh, you might control measures for your environment to be controlled. But unfortunately, sometimes in an open field, uh, a big fast food, it will be difficult to control the environment. So those are the three factors that I wanted to share with you on how uh, the background of how a disease develops. But in reality, usually, uh, you might not eliminate uh, each and every uh, factor of the disease triangle. You will reduce it. Maybe you reduce the effect of the favorable environment, which result in the uh, reduced disease. You might reduce uh, uh, the re, you might increase the resistance of the of the of your host 
uh, and the disease is reduced. But uh, usually the disease will develop, but it will, might not be of economic importance. So every time uh, that I get uh, called by farmers, they have challenges. Uh, my mind is always thinking about the disease triangle for whatever uh, challenge it is, if it is a disease, I first investigate uh, on the factors of the disease triangle. Is the environment conducive? Uh, the background of the of the host is it a susceptible one? What is the level of resistance? And I also now need to diagnose uh, what kind of a pathogen it is. So in this session, I'm going to discuss uh, three main uh, causing organisms for diseases. That is uh, fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Okay, so uh, examples of uh, fungal diseases, we look on the symptoms of a fungal disease. How I can distinguish between the three, the fungi, viruses, and bacteria. If you look closely, uh, uh, fungi causes, usually causes what we call necrosis. Necrosis, it is the death of a, of a plant tissue. You see those, those brown, brown spots on, on, or brown lesions on the leaves. That is what we call necrosis. And on fungi, if you look uh, closely on that leaf with the red leaf blotch, the fungi, the, the necrosis crosses the veins. So that is a major characteristics of fungal diseases. If you look closely on your leaf, if the veins are crossed, that is also the, the veins, there is also death of tissue. That means there is an indication that it could be a fungal disease. So I'm going to show you some examples of fungal diseases that are very common in uh, production of, uh, of cereals, legumes, and uh, in horticulture. For example, in a wet season, you will find uh, a fungal disease like uh, Gibberella erot. It is a uh, a fusarium, uh, it comes in from the fusarium classes. So if you walk in your field, uh, in your maize field, for example, after after silking, you find uh, that that it might have that uh, a death of the sheath that you find at the, at the end of it. So in the resultant, you get uh, a cob that has got a red a red, a red top, some refer to a red mouth of the cobs. So that is what we call Jibberella erod. And the conditions that it requires, it requires a warm, hot conditions, and it's also very humid. So in a very wet season, it's most likely that if you have a susceptible variety, you will find a Jibberella erod. Okay, so another, another common uh, fungal disease in maize that you can expect in a in a wet season is diplodia, where uh, the infection start from the bottom, start from the bottom of the cob uh, going upwards. So when you get such kind of uh, 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 symptoms, it's an infection that is caused by diplodia in a very wet season. And it's a, it's a very common uh, in Southern Africa and East Africa is very common. And uh, there is, uh, moderate resistance uh, for this kind of disease. The, the key thing is that for both Diplodia and Gibberella erod, they both have the pathogen comes uh, through the silks. Okay, another fungal disease that is very common uh, uh, in maize is gray leaf spot. So it is the gray leaf spot, it is uh, the symptoms, they look uh, rectangular. And they are like in stripes, uh, uh, they are also crossing some veins and they are rectangular. If you look at them, it's also a very uh, uh, disease that causes significant yield. But uh, the good thing is that the positive thing is that there is a hybrid that have got good resistance to this disease. This disease is GLA. So it is always advisable to farmers to, to inquire with the acid houses if the hybrid is there. Uh, are resistant to gray leaf spot depending on the area that we are growing. Okay, the next disease that is also very common uh, uh, when conditions are, are warm, humid, and uh, prolonged wetness is uh, northern corn leaf blight. Some refer to it as the HT, uh, naming it after the pathogen that causes it. These ones have got uh, 
a bigger patches that they cause on bigger necrosis that really spot. It is a uh, it is bigger and usually uh, for some that it is a big sign for breeders to see that if a hybrid is adapted to a, a particular geographical area or not. So really, uh, northern corn leaf blight can make your all your leaves to to dry as you can see on this, and it contributes significantly to yield losses. Okay, uh, moving on, uh, we have uh, this northern corn leaf blight is also common, uh, is a problematic disease also in sorghum. It's very common that you find it in sorghum, uh, but uh, uh, the positive thing is that there is resistance to, uh, there is hybrid that can, that are resistant to these uh, varieties. Okay, coming to soybean uh, fungal disease, uh, the common one is uh, soya bean rust. The soya bean rust has been a, a problematic disease for more than two decades. Uh, breeders have been working, working around the clock to find resistance, and there is some resistance to this disease. But uh, farmers are aged also to just find a, a, a fungicide that they can spray. Uh, I will highlight the remedies at the end that uh, a wide range of fungicides that can be used. So these are the, this picture shows uh, how devastating a soya bean rust can be. It, it leads to, uh, let me go back again to the uh, soya bean rust. It, uh, it leads to severe defoliation. So without defoliation, that means that you have uh, shriveled uh, kennels that you harvest and your yield can you can lose yield up to 100% with the soya bean rust. Okay, another disease uh, in in soya bean that is caused by fungal is a uh, white mold. Uh, it's also commonly referred to as uh, the sclerotinia. So this one uh, is very common when in a in a field that is that that are waterlogged, and uh, it's a soil bone fungi. It is mostly characterized when you see those uh, black dots that are on the on the on the soya bean, and they will be like a, a cotton. Like it's very difficult to to control this disease, and it also can persist in the soil for for three to four years. So it needs a big rotation, and farmers should uh, make sure that their their fields are not waterlogged. Otherwise, uh, it will lead to severe severe infection, it can also lead to wilting. And when the field uh, uh, is infected by sclerotinia, it is of quarantine importance and because it, it is spread easily and uh, uh, to many farmers and, and in soybeans, you, you might not get any yield. Okay, so uh, moving on to another disease that is very common in soybeans that we encounter, uh, mostly in Southern and East Africa that I refer to uh, is a red leaf blotch. So as, it name, as, as its name sounds, it's always a showing red. It will not, you will not get lost. If you look on the underside of it, uh, there's always uh, some reddish coloration. So usually it comes at flowering and post flowering. Okay, moving on uh, to, to sugar beans. Uh, the problematic disease that I could pick uh, or fungi that occurs in each and every year is uh, the angular leaf spot. So when buying sugar beans, it's always buying seed for sugar beans. It's always uh, good to check uh, the resistance level of that particular particular product for because uh, you you have uh, it affect the the seed the the the, the kernels that you will harvest on sugar beans they will they will be damaged and they will be lightweight if you put them in in water they all come up to the top meaning that they are less weight and you have uh, less yield significantly low yield so they affect the pods together with the, with the leaves infection start from the leaves then later on it goes to the to the pods. So angular leaf spot is one of those key diseases in sugar beans that uh, uh, farmers should be aged to look for. Okay, uh, so 
this is just a rundown of some of the remedies that you you can apply for all the diseases, fungal diseases that I've explained. Uh, of course, they are uh, different variation, but uh, if you look on the uh, active ingredient uh, uh, column, uh, uh, different different traders, they have different names for 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 those active ingredients that they trade with. But uh, usually, with the triazo and the strobilin uh, fungicide, they are broad based. That is, they cover uh, a, they are broad, broad spectrum. They cover most of the groups of fungi. They they are able to to prevent. They are mostly preventative and curative. Okay, so since this will be shared, it, it will be a guide for the farmers to to look for. Okay, so uh, we move on to, uh, to, to, to viruses. So viruses are, are just problematic in plants as they are also in animals that are, that are difficult to control. So even on this picture that you, you find all ranges of symptoms that you can think of with viruses uh, from yellow spots, necrotic spots, you find the blistering, you find some some symptoms that looks like uh, the crop has been damaged by a, by a herbicide. So you might confuse it with the herbicide damage when it is uh, actually a, a virus. And you can find wilting, uh, vein yellowing, yellow rings. You can also find uh, the mottling, the mosaic, and the killing of the leaves. So when you have uh, uh, symptoms that you, you, you do not understand, and the, they are different from the ones that I desc described that causes necrosis in like the ones that uh, I described of fungi. It's most likely a virus because a virus, the key thing is that uh, the plant leaves lose uh, chloro chlorophyll. So chlorosis usually is the key, key indicator that it could be a virus because viruses are transmitted by insects that usually come and suck up the cell by transmitting the virus and it multiplies in the plant. Okay, so I will show you some examples, uh, common examples of uh, viral disease. So these are some of the, uh, the, 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 the vectors that transmit uh, virus disease. And these are the insects, aphids, white flies, treats, sleep poppers. So the main control of viral disease is basically to control the insect. If you find your your, your field or a greenhouse field with, the, with insects. So whatever symptoms that you, you, you might find coming after that is that uh, it can be a, a viral disease transmitted by these insects. Okay, for example, uh, we find uh, a, 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 the, this, the kind of symptoms where there is a mosaic and the, and the and killing of soya bean. This is the soya bean mosaic virus. It is uh, a, when leaves have this uh, twisting of uh, twisting pattern that you you might usually it is caused by the virus. So if you search around the underside of your leaves, usually you find uh, these insects that are there. So the key thing for it not to spread is to control the insects. Okay, so uh, viruses are also common. Uh, also in maize, maize we have a, 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 a viral disease that is very key also uh, even in, in all, all, all over Africa, which is the maize trick virus. So the maize trick virus is transmitted by the leaf hoppers and aphids mainly. So uh, efforts have been made uh, on breeding against this disease. So many hybrids. Uh, with seed go they have we have uh, hybrids that are resistant to this disease and those susceptible are uh, treated with uh, with a then with a systematic insecticide that is absorbed with the, with the plant as it grows uh, it it will not uh, it will not permit for the virus to multiply okay so that that is the presentation that I have on viruses and bring in your question that you let uh, on answer them. Okay, so the third uh, organism that uh, we'll talk about on disease, uh, on disease development and management are bacteria. So bacteria are not as that complex like uh, 
like uh, fungi. So the key thing, the key differentiating thing from them from the from the fungi is that uh, if a, a bacterial infection doesn't cross the, the veins, usually you find what is called intervenal necrosis. That is, the necrosis goes along along the veins. It does not cross. It does not produce secondary substances like fungi that cross the veins. So. So usually that is the, one of the key things that you give you an indication that this is not a fungal, it could, it's not a viral disease, it's also a bacteria. And you also find what we call bacteria oils or streaming. Usually in the morning, you find some small droplets that, you, that, are, that are sticky on, on, on the plant. That is a, another sign of a bacteria. It can also cause a, a bad odor on a plant. So that is another uh, symptom or indication that this is could be bacterial disease. So I will just show you some common diseases of uh, bacteria. Uh, for example, in tomato, uh, the problematic disease that I've always come across uh, caused by bacteria is the bacterial spot. Bacterial spot it affect both the uh, both the leaves and ultimately the uh, the fruit. The fruit will have some some pimples like that is caused by bacteria and eventually uh, the, the fruit will rot. Okay, uh, and also the bacteria, if you look on in soya bean and maize, uh, in soya bean, the common one is bacteria or pustule. So if you look closely, uh, the, the necrosis is not crossing the veins. So it's just those spots that are occurring that is uh, bacteria. So uh, uh, the bacteria of stock rot is, is very common when you in, in the under irrigated field, uh, because in under irrigated fields where, where you have overhead irrigation, whether it's a center pivot or, or your, 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 your sprinklers, uh, uh, the rain droplets usually, the, the water droplets usually, uh, uh, usually they, 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 they sit for a long time in the funnel. And this one being a, uh, a, an air bond and both soil bond. So when it sits in the funnel for too long, that's when you have an infection. But usually if there is wind and it's a rain, uh, it's a, a, a rain season, usually you normally don't have a, a so much occurrence of, 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 of bacterial stock rot on maize. It's very common in, in a hot weather, and it's also uh, when there is overhead irrigation. Uh, I can uh, can only for bacteria the control measures are, are mainly based on 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 sanitation, where the personnel that across the food is to, uh, to be hygienic, because it's a disease that is occurs when there is less hygienic food. So. It's always key that uh, debris are removed after the season and in greenhouses, the growing media should not be uh, reused. Usually, if you see also the first signs of a bacterial infection, it is advisable to, to, to apply a copper-based fungicide. Usually, copper chloride after, a, after the leaves have become wet for a prolonged period, copper, copper Oxchloride or copper bags fungicide usually offer a good control. Okay, so uh, this is another uh, form of a bacteria. If you look, halo blight is also very common in sugar beans. Uh, it affects both the, 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 the leaves and the pods. Okay, so my uh, the section that I'm going to discuss with you, the insect uh, uh, pest management uh, for cereals, you have uh, a wide range of food. Of, of uh, insects, cutworms, and um, uh, and for armyworm, for armyworm and stock borer, the key ones in maize. But I will just highlight that uh, uh, the key thing is to scout your field and co control very early when the when the insects are still or the larvae is still very young, so it will be easier to control. When the larvae are bigger, they will be difficult to control. In horticultural crops, you also have. Uh, uh, different, uh, different pests that uh, uh, different pests that affected uh, a major classes or families of of 
uh, of uh, of what we culture of crops from cutworms, moths, the aphids. They also transmit viruses. So it is always key, like especially for those uh, crops that are being grown uh, in greenhouses. It is very key to always scout for these insects. So I, I highlight here the remedies that can be used uh, to control these uh, a range of insects. Uh, just the, like the same way that uh, they are treated with different names depending on the supplier, but it is key to look on the active ingredient uh, and check uh, which one suits uh, your, your particular problem. So this is just a summary of my presentation on the, this is all I can present on uh, pest diseases and uh, pests and diseases. If you have any questions, we'll entertain them uh, soon after uh, the presentation. So I will hand over to Wendy Mazura to, to look on this uh, safe use of chemicals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nyasha for that uh, elaborate presentation on uh, pest and uh, disease management. And I'm, I was seeing from the questions column, we are going to be attending to some of your questions, but I think some of them, if not most of them have been answered, but you find that there is power in reinforcing and repeating. So we are going to move on and look at the other issues. So having said all this, we've mentioned the use of chemicals, but chemicals also require for you to come in with stewardship and come in with the safe use of the agrochemicals to protect yourselves as well as your employees at the farm and make sure that you safeguard against the side effects that these chemicals may come with. So when using any chemical, it's important for you to always note the fact that chemicals are always going to come with a label, which is a list of instructions that speaks to what the product is supposed to do. Boring as it might be to go through a label or to read it, or difficult as it might be to understand it, it still remains an important piece of information and part of the puzzle in unlocking what the product is supposed to do. Because it will speak to the dosage rate, it will speak to the interval of application, it will speak to the rotation a crop, the harvest interval for you when you're going to be applying in produce, produce that is going to be consumed, it will speak to the compatibility with other products. So reading and understanding the label is important. Another important thing, the label usually comes with triangles. So these triangles are going to speak to the level of toxicity that exists in the different products. So you find that the green is the product that is least toxic, not to say it's not toxic at all, because all chemicals are poisonous. So green is going to be least toxic, moving on until we reach the purple label product. So it's important to understand the product that you're going to use and the degree of safety, uh, safe clothing um, that you're supposed to wear, including the goggles, the respirator, as well as the, the gloves and the work suit. You need to make sure that you understand what you need depending on the toxicity level of the product. So when you use herbicides, pesticides and fungicides that are recommended, you need to use products that are recommended for a particular crop. Speaking to those farmers who are still planting sugar beets now, Make sure the product that you are using is for sugar beans and not for soya beans, as this may differ and it will scorch your crop. As you can see on the picture there, it's a dismal site on my right, on my left. But on my right, that crop was planted on the same day. The only difference is that on the other side, mistakenly so, they applied glyphosate. Then on the other side, they did not apply glyphosate. Maybe it was on a different day and they had rectified their problem. But it's important for you to note the level of damage and the level of um, economic loss that they are going to incur from just one mistake of not thoroughly reading and understanding instructions that were written on the label. So in, we spoke what to do with the protective clothing. We also spoke about the way you're going to store the product. Chemicals, like we say, the mistake is to think that if it's a green label, maybe we can store it to food or even in the same uh, containers with our food. But it's recommended at all costs for you to come in with a safe house or a safe corner, lockable, where you're going to store chemicals to avoid unnecessary disasters and unnecessary uh, mistakes occurring. Now, just to look at a few other important issues to take note of as we run to the end of our, uh, of our presentation, 
The importance of mulching. Mulching is a two-edged sword. In the event that we have uh, low moisture, it's going to conserve the moisture. It's, but in the event that the moisture is in abundance, where the weed contour is going to be excess, it is also going to help in suffocating the, the, the weeds that we're going to grow there. It also comes in with the ability to cover the ground, thereby reducing the incidence of runoff and erosion, especially given the rains that we are receiving in this season, you would not want for the top soil to be washed away. So coming in with mulching would help for that. It will also help in the retention of the organic matter and avoids unnecessary loss of organic matter. And it speaks heavily to issues to do with sustainable agriculture in a bid to move hand in glove with the global initiatives of coming in with smart agricultural solutions. Then just to highlight the drainage management tips, given that we are in a season where the rains are persistent, you can check on the picture that is highlighted there in the, um, with, the, with the red X, you find that that crop there is suffering from water logging conditions. The water has even drilled a, a road through the field, which is not going to be good for the crop. Imagine if AN fertilizer was applied in that field, is it still there? Even if it's urea, if it was applied on the surface, the moisture was there, but because of the, the, the runoff, it might have been washed away. So it's important for you to take note of that. When you are establishing a crop during this time, be it sugar bean or horticultural crops specifically, it is recommended that you do so on raised beds or ridges because this will allow for drainage to occur and it will also allow for the roots to grow freely and without being soaked in water. Contour farming is also encouraged where you are going to establish your crop against the slope so that there is no free runoff of water. So just in conclusion, these are just the highlights in, in pictorial form of some of the many activities that we are embarking on, going, following behind our crops and making sure that the farmer gets the value out of the crop that they've established by employing good agronomic practices. This comes from the fact that CITCO is an extensive network of agronomists in every province, commercial and for communal farmers. So there is an agronomist ready to assist at any time with any technical information that you might require. You can also refer to our website. The CITCO website has information loaded with information that is going to add value in your cropping venture. We also have an application. Uh, we also have um, an application that can provide technical advice and more is going to be availed as we continue to adopt to the new normal and bring about new methods of extension delivery through our different extensive networks. So in conclusion, we'll wrap up by bringing out the point that we started off with. There are a thousand reasons, more than a thousand, infinite reasons, so to say, of why farmers are failing and why we are failing to be productive. But there are only two reasons for profitable farming. Access to good genetics. Good genetics is the secret ingredient in farming profitably. And the unlocking of those good genetics by employing good agronomic practices. So this presentation does not only speak to the previous season that we were, that we went through, but it speaks to the seasons that are coming. Right now we are already preparing for the winter farming season, the wheat farmers, the horticulture farmers in frost free areas, as well as the summer season that is going to come. This is the time for you to make a self-evaluation and take note of the areas that were uh, that you, you came short and make the necessary remedial and corrective measures while at least you still have the ample time to come up with good solutions. So in conclusion, I'll just wrap up by giving you in quotes the words of the African Development Bank president, two-time president, Akinumi Adesina, who said, and I quote, the future millionaires and billionaires of Africa will not be coming from oil, from the gas sector, they will be coming from the agricultural sector. But I want African countries to be looking at agriculture as a business, not as a hobby or a way of life. Nobody smokes gas, nobody drinks oil, but everybody eats food. So food is critical, and that is what Africa is to, to be competitive. And that is what Africa has a comparative advantage in. And crop life at some point said, once in a life, you might need a lawyer. 
you might need a teacher you might need a you might need to go to the dentist but every day two times a day three times four times even you need to eat so every day you need a farmer so allow me to conclude by thanking you for joining us in this presentation and encouraging you as essential as we are we are only essential if we are alive so let's play our part in preventing the spread of COVID-19 by adhering to the stipulations and guidelines that we have been provided with. On that note, I'm going to invite questions. While the questions are still coming in, the question and answer segment is going to be 10 minutes. I'm going to be addressing the questions that we were getting on our chat platform, but some of them we've already um, explained. Nyasha, there was a question that we got from Anonymous. What, who was asking, what are you referring to when you're talking about a host? What is a host? Okay, so a host is, uh, in this case, we are referring to a plant, a plant that can that can get in, in infection with the disease. For example, maize is a host for gray leaf spot, soybean is a host for rust. So any crop that is, uh, that is, that can be a recipient of a disease is what we call a host. Thank you very much, Nyasha, for that. Then we had a question. We had a question that was speaking about um, from Clayton Matsikure, who is asking if it's three split applications of AN, how frequent should I apply them? So the recommendation as we rightfully said, is a guide, it's general. It's not a one size fits all. Your custom made recommendation should then come from fertilizer analysis, depending on the nutrient requirement of the soil and the desired yield potential that you are working with. So if you're going to do, say for example, three applications, it also depends on the soil type that you have. For sandy soils, it's recommended to do at least two, then three applications. But for clay soils, two applications may suffice. But when you are coming in, you'll be guided by the weather conditions as well. Where if the rainfall is persistent, you can come in at around three to four weeks when the vegetative stage kicks in. That, that is the time when you see that a crop that has not been given additional nitrogen starts turning pale green because it's now ready for the next stage of development. Then after that, you can come in at two week intervals with additional top dressing fertilizer. Then the other question that we got, was uh, is from um, Mufaro. Mufaro is asking about all things being normal. What is the last stage of the application of ammonium nitrate fertilizer? All things being normal, we would recommend that you come in during the time when that fertilizer is most likely to be utilized by the crop during the vegetative stage. If you come in when the reproductive stage has kicked in, which is from tasseling onward, chances are that fertilizer is not going to be used effectively and you might not incur the benefit that you were going to get that you come in earlier with the application of that fertilizer. Then this one is for you, Nyasha. It's from Gilbert Gatsi. What causes the whitish color on the maize leaves? I think you spoke about it, but maybe you can reiterate. Okay, it depends uh, what kind of uh, coloration is it. Maybe some, some whitening can be is very, what I know that the whiting on leaves are, is common on the irrigated uh, on an irrigated maize crop where you might have uh, your your water being salty and it can cause uh, uh, that whitish on on leaves. So it's not for, uh, much of importance. But in rain in, in a rain season, uh, I'm not sure what is referring to, but uh, it. Uh, it could not be a disease, but it's very common on irrigated uh, uh, fields where you have uh, a, the water may be salty, uh, then you have those coming, uh, accumulating on leaves. Thank you so much for that. Then um, let's see the other questions that we got. Can we, this is from Olusegam, Isaiah Ogunyemi, who says, can we have a full list of guide and recommendation for maize cultivation. So yes, sit with an agronomy manual that we are going to share uh, on your email. 
you having attended our presentation, it's going to be shared. And it is it has a detailed explanation on not only on maize, but other field crops. And should you need a, a guide on horticulture production, it will be provided as well. Then there's a question from Munyaradzi Karma, Karmazo, Karmazondo. I would like to plant maize, but Tangadzi is a problem. Please help. How do I deal with it? Deal with it? So with uh, Tangadzi, kuch grass, the problem is that it's more prolific underground, where it has an extensive root system, as opposed to what you're going to be seeing on the surface. So when you're coming in with the products to apply, say, for example, uh, in maize, uh, assuming that at this point, uh, Mr. Munyarad is not looking at planting this crop, assuming that this crop has germinated and it's already, uh, the weed has also germinated, the farmer can then come in with a wide range of products that, um, uh, that are available on the market, which we do not usually want to refer to the trade names because we might leave out some products, but I'll give you three examples. You can come in with Stella Star, Oxo, or you can come in with Sakura can help in mitigating the effects of this weed. However, if the next time you're establishing your next crop, you can come in with glyphosate at a time when the weed is active and green and you have not established your crop, as this herbicide will go into the system and effectively kill the, the, the crop right down to the weeds. Then uh, we have a question from Finini Nkala. What vegetable do you recommend at this time of season, which doesn't require much attention? Wow, interesting. Every crop requires attention if it's going to be profitable. This is the only reason, this is the only way you're going to go in regularly, frequently scouting and communicate. Some farmers even say you need to be a food soldier. You need to be a crop doctor and be in your crop. So there's no crop that requires less attention than the other. You need to be hands-on and be on top of the situation. Looking at horticulture, most horticultural crops can still be started at this time. The challenge, however, is that from the persistent rain, disease pressure tends to be high. So you also need to come in with a more strict uh, program in terms of fungicide prevention, as well as a strict program in terms of management of problematic insect pests that might okay. So some farmers are planting butternuts, but some farmers are also now starting to do their onion seed beds and all the other crops that fit within the cropping window. If it's a 100% rain fed crop, look at the seasonal forecast and align it with the region that you're going to be growing your crop and make sure that the crop still fits within the number of days that you expect to get of rainfall. Then we have a question from Emmanuel Ojo. If I can harrow my farm without the use of glyphosate and then use pre-imagined herbicides, do you think this is enough to control weeds on my farm? It's a broad, very broad question, but um, coming in with conservation a conventional tillage method is going to, to, to destroy the, the, the weeds that are available on the surface. And there won't be any actively growing weeds uh, at the time of planting, uh, provided that the farmer doesn't come in late after the land preparation is done. So if there are no weeds available on the ground, there is no need to apply glyphosate. Suffice to say, glyphosate is one of the most abused herbicides. When it's applied on the ground, expected to kill weed seeds, but it doesn't do that, it's going to only kill whatever is green on the surface at the time of applying. Then we have a question from, um, let's look at some of the questions that we have answered in the interest of other farmers. We still have seven minutes. There's a question for you, Nyasha. What causes cobs to develop, but without a full grain coverage? Mavende Pamuguri. Yasha, that's a question from Romeo Candido. Oh, okay. So I had answered it uh, uh, oh, on, on typing. So I was saying that uh, usually uh, it's because there was, not pro there was no proper pollination. So it means that maybe the tassel was disturbed and there was no pollen that could reach the silks, or the silks were not uh, were damaged and they could not receive. Usually, it happens when the temperatures are maybe uh, frost, and then the pollen is damaged. They are not viable to for pollination, or is too hot, and then the viability of the pollen is affected. 
So at the end of the day, uh, there's no pollination that, that occurs. So you should know that each and every silk represents a seed. So if there's no pollen that lands on that silk or the silk is damaged, you have your grain uh, not really fully filled with seeds. Thank you, Nyasha. I think you've then answered uh, Romeo Candido's follow-up question where he was saying, uh, can excess heat of above 40 degrees cause damage to the tassels? But like you rightfully said, pollen needs a, vi a conducive environment for it to, 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 to remain viable. So if there is excess heat, if there's excess cloud cover, that process is going to be affected. So thank you so much for that. Then we have a, a broad question here from Kenneth. What is your best recommended herbicide on, on grasses in maize production? So for grasses in maize production, at pre-emergence, they are the most commonly used uh, products using active ingredients is uh, metalaclo, s metalaclo. some use alaclo, some use um, used uh, mostly by most farmers, but new chemistry is available where some farmers can come in with uh, products such as bravo, specialists who can assist with trade names of new chemistry that is available. Then uh, looking at post-emergence, you can come in with the herbicides that we mentioned earlier, that include your, your, your stellar star, that include your, your uh, oxo, that also include uh, sakura and other products uh, that come in with, depending on the, on the grass, some products that are going to kill chamber grass, like your nicosulfuron, some products that are going to kill sages like your halo sulfuron. So you need to be specific. Dear farmers, when dealing with herbicides, you need to be as specific as possible to the last dot. Otherwise you risk buying the wrong product, applying wrongly or coming in with a residual effect into your crop. Then we have um, a question here, Nyasha. Uh, interesting, Romeo seems to have a lot of questions. We'll send through a detailed um, Agronomy manual to you, Mr. Romeo Candido. Nyasha, Romeo is asking, what proactive spraying program should we implement for four armyworm? A proactive one. Okay, so so for four armyworm, uh, what we should do, we recommend that usually four armyworm comes three to four weeks after uh, after germination. Then when they come, they will be very small. So in that case, uh, we have. Uh, 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 insects said that we listed based on uh, an active ingredient called the emamactin benzo. It is commonly used. Uh, then there is the one that the ones that are based on colorandrin uh, uh, po, like built, and uh, also you uh, at that stage even when they are small, you can even use uh, uh, karate when they are very time in the uh, the first stage of. Uh, of the level stage, so so in as we highlighted here on the on the on the remedies on the remedies, uh, we have different classes that you can use and you can alternate them. So the other ones are big, uh, are based on phenuron or indoxicab. Those you can rotate with the ones that I mentioned, uh, the Eba, uh, the emamactin benzoate. So different classes of protecting different classes of, of insecticides. Usually, if you do two sprays a season, we have seen that it, it is a, a positive effect to control the, the worms for the whole season. Thank you so much, Nyasha. We are left with two minutes, so we're going to try and cover as many questions as we can. We have a question here from Tero Leago. Uh, Tim, I'm in Botswana. And normally we have challenges killing stock borer on maize. When, when, when is it? I'm, I'm sure you wanted to say at which stage do, would you recommend them to control stock borer? Okay, so usually stock borer, as the name says, it uh, it usually uh, comes when the stock is uh, is is now uh, rigid and it usually likes to burrow in the stock. So what normally is recommended if your field is uh, small, you can use uh, dipterics where you, you drop it into the funnel where the insect will be hiding. So the dipterics, those are granular ones, they stay in the funnel, then they will control. 
Or alternatively, you can use the the uh, the insecticide that we listed here for for, for armyworm. They are also good to, uh, on on stock border. They are used as foliar foliar sprays. But uh, you 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 see what is viable to you. The granular one where you drop into the funnel or use a, a foliar spray where you you spray with a boom sprayer to to control the stock border. Thank you very much, Nyasha. Then we have Farai Jim who's asking. I'm in region three Midlands, which is the best maize seed that I can plant. Thank you for bringing out that question. It, it would not be a, a seed co presentation without us explaining some of the varieties that we have. Uh, however, suffice to say that uh, the planting time, the planting window is now passed for the summer crop. But we have a wide range of products from the ultra early maturing varieties that mature in 90 to 120 days, where we have uh, the 301. We also have new genetics. We are not. Uh, Stopping every time we're trying to come to climate smart varieties. So we have SC419 that can be established. It's a very early maturing variety, came in to complement 403. Then we also have in the 500 series new flagships, SC555 and SC557 um, that came in to complement SC513 and uh, SC529. So we have a wide product basket of early, very early, and medium as well as late maturing varieties that can establish. However, the window for planting maize at this time is past. So now it's 11 past two. We're going to add additional four minutes and conclude at quarter past so that we cover the remaining questions. So if you have a burning question, please send it through. We have a question here from Boibuso Kedikanetwe. Which chemical should one use for Acanthoplus discola? Uh, species in maize. Nyasha. Acantho plus species in maize. Which chemical should be used? Okay. Thank you very much. Nyasha is having technical challenges. I'll share my screen once I've read two questions that you need to attend to. The other question is from Mufaro Mutume. Do you recommend Ecoterex? For four armyworm control, do you recommend Ecoterex for four armyworm? Yes, indeed. Uh, Ecoterex, uh, uh, we recommend it for four armyworm control. Uh, just got an active ingredient, Emma Max Vendor, that I, I listed there. So uh, it can easily control the four armyworm. Okay, thank you so much. Then uh, let's see which other questions we can squeeze in. Uh, there's Alan Morris Shumba. Alan is asking, uh, hi guys, I understand you now have varieties that don't grow. Uh, suckers, anything on the yellow varieties? Suckers. What causes suckers to grow? Yeah, you can respond to that. Uh, usually uh, suckers are only, I, I usually uh, see suckers on, when someone retained the seed, especially for a, a second generation, that's when you might find seeds. But for, but only a, a first generation of hybrids, usually it's very, very rare. So on a second generation where you take your harvested seed that was harvested last year, the grain one, then you use it as a seed this season, you might uh, uh, get uh, uh, suckers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nyasha, for that. Then uh, there's a question from uh, Walter Mazuru. Mr. Mazuru, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Nyasha, did you uh, quite address the bacterial remedies on tomatoes, uh, for example? Uh, but before Nyasha comes in, suffice to say bacterial uh, problems in crop production are a huge challenge. The remedial measures are a huge challenge, but Nyasha is going to come in with a response to that. Nyasha, over to you. Okay, so uh, for uh, for the... Okay, for the bacterial challenges that you find maybe mostly in vegetables, because uh, the main cause is that uh, when you have uh, leaf wetness usually overnight uh, or a prolonged period of uh, wetness on the leaves, that's when you, you have your bacteria growing. Those droplets that come from the soil, then they land on the soil and they remain humid, uh, humid over a, a long time. It usually causes uh, bacteria to develop. Usually, uh, what we recommend is that uh, uh, a, a copper-based fungicide 
uh, is the one that you can can you, you can use as preventative. Uh, not much of a not much of of uh, a, a good measure as uh, as curative, but as a preventative. Uh, that copper copper based fungicide will form a layer that will prohibit the development of of bacteria. The also other thing, like for example, in the in the greenhouse in for tomatoes, uh, it should be kept well aerated and also to remove residues from the previous season. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Nyasha. Then there's a question here from a farmer who's asking if they can uh, still plant uh, soya beans. It's Lois Magopolo um, who's asking where, if they can still plant sugar beans now. So no, you cannot plant sugar beans now. We recommend sugar beans. Uh, you cannot plant soya beans now. Soya beans, the window is passed. You can plant sugar beans at this time. Then uh, there's a question here on what culture. Uh, watermelons split a lot. Yes, they do, especially if they are all PV seeds, we recommend hybrids, which will have uh, the ability to withstand that pressure. But however, in persistent rains that we are ex uh, experiencing, it is uh, a challenge that watermelons usually face because they don't have the ability to guard against excess water uptake. So on that note, it is said that all good things come to an end. Thank you so much for joining us in this uh, interactive uh, summer crop management webinar. So this presentation has been recorded and once it has been downloaded, we are going to share it with you. Feel free to engage us on our different platforms. We are going to be sharing as well on our different uh, platforms, our website, www.citcogroup.com, which is our hub of information. And remember that CITCO is an extensive network of agronomists ready to assist you. Farming is indeed a business. It starts with the right seed, coupled with good agronomic practices. From me, Wendy Mazura and Nyasha Chiuraise, thank you for joining us and have a pleasant and blessed time. Stay safe during this COVID pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.